all that we are, and that is within us, that worships him above all things at all times. Lord, we give you praise, honor, and glory as we enter into worship. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. There is nothing that overcomes or overpowers the love that you gave us the day you said, let all things be done when you entered that cross, Lord. Your love was so amazing that it gave us life. It gave us eternal life, oh Lord. We can't praise you and honor you enough in Jesus' name.
from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. Lord, your word says that we will not fail, but victory will be ours in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before the man. 
Surfaces itself around the holy presence, Lord, the one, the only God Almighty, the one who was, who is, and who is to come, the one who shines through all things, the one who holds the earth, the world, the, the whole system, the universe in his hands. That is the one that is worthy of it all.
up Lord fill us up let the spirit come alive within us yes. let us feel your presence right now yes. oh Lord Jesus. let the presence fill this house yes. right now heavenly father I just ask you as the word goes forth today Lord let it become a part of our hearts and who we are yes. as we listen father God to the word from you in Jesus name Amen. 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 Woo, thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that you bless these offerings and, and gifts and use them to expand your realm. Lord, we just look to you for everything. You're the one constant in our lives that bring us together. And Lord, we love you and we ask that you guide each and every one of us. And Lord, the victory is yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. So what about the worship, right? Hallelujah. Worshiping the Lord our God. There's nothing like it, nothing better. He is worthy of it all. Praise God. 
I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it this morning. Uh, when we find ourselves, I've been talking to y'all about three weeks now about this. You find yourselves in a fiery trial. You find yourselves in a, a place of trouble, and it looks like you just have, you, you start questioning things, you know? I'm going to tell you something I do. <laughs> but I heard, a, I heard a sermon, and um, I was listening to this pastor. He was talking, and he said, you know, he said, people find themselves in sin, or they find themselves in trouble in life, things happening in their life. And then all of a sudden, just kind of like Saul, the heart starts getting hard. And it starts a little bit at the time, you know, just a little at the time. And then something else will happen, and something else will happen. And on top of that, something else happens. And the heart continues to get a little bit harder and a little bit harder until we start fading away from Jesus and what he did at the cross. And we forget that it was him and what he did that gives us complete and total peace, right? Joy when there's no joy. Happiness when there's no happiness. Sadness whenever there's sadness, right? We forget that the cross took all of it for us. But in Saul's time, he didn't have the cross yet. But he knew God, knew of God, right? But he still allowed life's troubles and happenings to harden his heart now we're and what happened to him boom god left him he said you know you you've hardened your heart to me through all the things i've done for you you've hardened your heart to me and then on the other side of that we have king david oh boy king david mm. king david could have found a hardened heart too because of the things that happened, the sin in his life, the things that was going on at that time in the world, right? At that particular time. He was a king, right? He had everything that you could ever want. He even had God. But life still crept in. And it, it chased him down into the caves, the hills for years. That could have hardened his heart to God. But he never allowed it to harden his heart. But what he did was come right back to God every time. Every time. And he said, in Psalms, he said, Renew a right heart within me, O God. So during those times, the only thing I can figure with King David was during those times of trouble, and those times he was being pressed and pressed and pressed, he was renewing his heart with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, leave me not, he said. He was being pressed. Well, you know what? We find ourselves in those times, too, sometimes, where life looks like it just ain't going to give. No matter what we're doing for the Lord, no matter how hard we're trying to work for him and press into him. And, but actually, it seems like the more I try to do that and the more we try to do that, we see the pressing, right? So as the pressing comes, what do we have to do to keep the heart right? Hmm? You're going to hear about it this morning, I believe, from, from Pastor Joe. But at the same time, pressing in pressing in prayer seeking God seeking his word renewing that right spirit within us now sometimes we don't have time to sit down and get in the word for an hour so then where do we go what what now that's when I rely on the word that I've already put in me and the Holy Spirit to refresh me in it right Renew that spirit within me, O oh Lord. Now, when we choose to not allow that to happen, when we don't ask for it, when we choose to just start doing what Saul did, okay? Saul, he just, he said, you know what? Mm -mm. I, um, I, yeah, I know what God's done for me, but 
But this, but he allowed that spirit to come in him of hardening. And once that happened, he was done. So we have to remember the cross, first of all. No matter what's going on in our life, I would do, I, we have to remember what it did for us. First, it gave us life. It gave us redemption from sin. It gave us healing. It gave us everything. When he took it, it left nothing undone. So what do I do now? Now is when I find myself in that place in life that I'm feeling low. I'm feeling burdened. I'm feeling that hardening of the heart try to creep in. That's when I go right back to the cross. That's when I get to that cross and I fall on my face and I get on my knees and I say, Lord Jesus, renew the right spirit within me. Renew my heart, O oh Lord. Let me not become hardened that I don't see you and everything you're still doing every day because he's still working no matter what. That song comes to mind. No matter what, you're still working, Lord. You're still working. So he's a way maker. He's a promise keeper. And he's still working, even in those trials and times of hardship in our life. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know about my husband, and I haven't really talked to him recently about what he's feeling and how he's going through the things that we're going through in our life. But I will say this. I know what I'm going through. And I, I said this morning, you know, I, I, he, said he made a comment to me. I don't even remember what it was, something, something about a movie or something, and he, a book. And I'm, in my mind, automatically, my first thought was, okay, no big deal. But to him, it was a big deal. To him, it was funny, you know, that <laughs> this movie was still here from a childhood book he had read. I'm, okay. I didn't see the humor in that. Why? Why couldn't I find the joy in that? Because my heart was not right at the moment, at that time. My heart is feeling heavy. It's feeling burdened. It's feeling tired. My mind is feeling tired. My body's feeling tired. And when I get to that place, what do I need to do? See, I'm having to remind myself right now, as well as, as I'm giving the word out to you, what do I need to do? I need to go find my cross and pick it up again. Not put it down, but pick it up. Because what did Jesus tell me to do? He said, you take my yoke, right? Because it's light. And he says, give me your yoke because I can carry it, it's heavy. He's already done it. He already carry, he's already carrying my burdens for me. But I have to remember to look to him, to seek him, to find him, so to be able to get through these trials that I'm in right now. Hallelujah. All right, I'm going to turn Pastor Joe over to you. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to share this morning. Thank you, brother. All right. You know, like I said before, Pastor Rachel was asking me not to let her know what I'm going to preach on because she wants to get it just like y'all do. But, man, she just keeps about taking my sermons from me. Well, Scripture says out of, out of the uh, mouths of two or three witnesses, right? So um, I just want to give a couple announcements. Um I'm going to just ask y'all, uh, like, like Pastor Rachel was, just keep praying for our family. Mallory is still in the hospital. Uh, you know, we, Rachel and I have had our grandkids now for uh, a month and a week, uh, five weeks now. Uh, so we're, we're not at the age it's, it's easy to keep up with, with the little kids anymore, you know. So, so it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it kind of makes it that hard on us a little bit. So um, just, just keep us lifted up. Keep Mallory lifted up in prayer. Uh, she is getting better, um, you know, so uh, we're, we're just anxiously awaiting the day that, that we know that God's promise was that she's going to be healed and get to come home. So we're, we're just anxiously awaiting the manifestation of that promise, okay? So as y'all anxiously await the manifestation of that promise with us, just, just keep us lifted up. Uh, also, this coming Saturday, 
Uh, we need to do a work day to anybody that, that can come. Um, a couple of things that I wanted uh, we need to do is, is we just about got the, the kids' room, fellowship hall, whatever else room we need it for, ready to paint. A few other things we got to do. Some things I got to get a hold to somebody else to, to take care of that we cannot. But um, also what used to be the dishwasher room, we're going to turn that into a kitchen. It's already got a sink in there. Uh, we've we've got to just basically get it cleaned out. We've got to uh, work on getting the plumbing fixed and then get it ready that we can have uh, uh, our electrician come in and run a uh, 220 in there for a stove. Uh, and we're going to try to get a refrigerator in there. Uh, we got a table that we're going to put in there. And we're going to have that like little kitchen so that, that we can even cook things here for like celebrate recovery. Uh, on the nights uh, we have celebrate recovery, maybe heat something up or cook something there. Or, the, you know, what I would really love to start doing is just having some just some fellowship dinners in there with the church. Everybody in the church, right after church, you know, maybe we'll, we'll come in, we'll have everybody bring a potluck sometime. And we'll go in there and we'll just, after church, instead of going out to our various ways to the various restaurants, we're going to just come in there and we can just sit down and just fellowship. You know, you know, as, as Christians, we've got to use the, the proper Christian phrases, right? The, the Christian lingo, fellowship. What the rest of the world calls pigging out, we're going to just, we're going to call it fellowship. How's that? Amen. So that's, that's something that we're looking forward to doing. Another thing is, is once we get all this done, what I want to do is I want to have a building dedication. I've already talked to uh, some people. And the people that are uh, that are my accountability, uh, ones that are over me uh, about, uh, you know, coming and, and uh, that letting y'all be able to meet them, see who they are, and so forth like that. And, you, you know, you can tell all your bad stories about Pastor Joe and how mean he is to them, you know, if you want to. <laughs> no, I'm just playing around. But uh, we're also going to have our, our, uh, our whole board here. Uh, most of our board does live here. We got one that lives in Florida that has so graciously uh, said that he's willing to do it. And he said he's going to come for it. And we're going to just have a dedication. We're going to just dedicate this building. What used to be a restaurant and, 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 and a beer joint at one time, I think it was. And, you know, uh, just, you know, alcohol was always served here all the time. And we're going to just dedicate this. This is going to be holy ground. Amen. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to just like Solomon dedicated the temple. And who knows, God might show up just like in Solomon and such a thick, heavy cloud. The priest had to leave the building. Everybody had to leave and lay down on the ground because the presence of God was like a heavy cloud in that place. So, amen. That's what might happen here. Hallelujah. All right. So, uh. Today, I want to talk, continue talking about prayer. God has just been putting this on my mind. And, you know, last week we talked about, does God hear my prayer? Sometimes it just feels like God is just not listening. You know, God just God is just so far away. And, and, we, and we talked about some things about that. God does hear prayers, right? He does hear your prayer. And sometimes we just have to to tarry just a little bit for it. And I want to continue on that. And some of this, what I'm going to talk about today, is going to continue on uh, basically what and touch a little bit on about what I preached about last week. So Cameron, go bring the slide up for me. So today what I want to talk about is effective praying. See, we heard that God hears our prayers, right? So we know he does. But now what I want to talk about is, is how can we effectively pray that, you know, when you effectively do something, that means you're going to get the effect of what it is that you're trying to do. Right. That's where that word comes from. So we're going to talk about effective praying. So if everybody would stand with me for a moment, just reading God's word. James 5, 16 and 18 says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced fruit. Father God, we thank you that you do hear our prayers, Lord God. Father, we just ask now, Lord, that, that Lord, is that we can just learn how to effectively pray. Lord, prayers that produce the effect that we're looking for, Father God. 
prayers that not only reach heaven, but open up heaven's windows of blessings in our lives. Prayers that not only reach heaven, but it puts angels to flight, angels to flee, uh, to, to fight for us, God, that puts demons to flee because the angels are there fighting for us, so Father God. Father, prayers that help us to walk in faith upright and not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to effectively go and win people and make disciples, Father God. That's the kind of prayers, Lord, that we're looking for. So, Father, we thank you right now that you hear our prayers and you want to teach us how to effectively pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So now, like I said, last week we were talking about, does God hear my prayers? And we know that God hears the prayers of, of the righteous, right? But now I do want to ask you this, and this might kind of surprise you after what I preached about last week, is does God hear all prayers? Surprisingly, the answer is no. And we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. We're going to talk about prayers that God does not answer, and then we're going to talk about how to effectively pray. See, some people might have thought that God, you know, like I used to, that God does hear all prayers. But believe it or not, he doesn't. See, I was always taught that God, like our parents, answered with yes, and we get right away what we ask for. You know, your, your, your kids come up and say, Mom, Dad, can I have a cookie? And you say, sure, and you get a cookie out of the cookie jar and give it to them. They see what? The immediate result of the prayer, right, of, of their asking. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes I'll, I'll lose something. I'll say, oh, Holy Spirit, and I'm good at losing things, by the way. I say, Holy Spirit, help me to find my car keys, all right, or help me to find my wallet or, or whatever it is that I have misplaced. And as I'm praying that, all of a sudden, it'll come into my mind, I need to go look at this place. I go over there and go look, and there it is. So I got an immediate answer to my prayer, right? And so sometimes that God does say yes, and we get that immediate answer. But I was also, told, also taught that sometimes God says wait. We have to wait for something, you know? Just like when the kid says, Mom, Dad, can I have a cookie? You got to wait till after supper. Now, see, in the kid's mind, you just, you didn't say, wait, what did you say? You said no, right? So they're going to go ask dad, and, you know, they ask mom first, now they're going to go ask dad, right? But, you know, sometimes we're told to wait, and sometimes we do have to wait on our answer. And then God sometimes says no, that we can't have what we're asking for. And I see sometimes we take that as God just didn't hear my prayer. So we're going to keep asking, because what do kids do when you say, can I have a cookie? No. But please, I want a cookie. No. But please, can I have? No. All right. Sometimes God tells us that, because, you know, sometimes I would say, God, can I win the lottery? All right. I haven't won the lottery yet. Okay. Not that I'm playing the lottery, but I would like to just win it without having to put any money out. Right. But anyway. Uh, but the thing is, is sometimes, you know, people pray like that. They want to say, God, you know, I, I want this. God, I want. But the God's saying no because he knows that what is going to happen is it's going to turn their heart away from him. Or they're going to do something stupid with it, you know, and get hurt or killed. So God, like our parent, you know, says, no, we can't have it. You know, it kind of reminds me of the that boy in um, the, what was it? The, uh, the, uh, was it the Christmas story? Where he kept asking, for, he wanted the BB gun, and, and, and his mom said, no, you'll shoot your eye out with it. But, you know, like many others, if I didn't get what I wanted, I just thought God simply didn't hear my prayer. However, there are prayers that God does not answer. And I will go as far as to say that they are actually ignored by God. Wow. Wow. So today I want to talk about the prayers that don't get answered, and I want to talk about how to effectively pray so that prayers do get answered. First, I want to talk about prayers that do not get answered, prayers that are not answered. The first thing I want to talk about is 
unbelievers' prayers don't get answered. If you look at John thirty, uh, John nine thirty one, it says, "Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God, he do and does His will, he hears Him." Can you can you hear the condition in which John was talking about? He said that we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God, and what? If anybody's a worshiper of God and and what does his will, then it was to say he God hears him. So, see, we can't just be say, I believe in God, because even James says believing in God is good. Even the demons believe in fear and tremble. Have you ever heard you've heard people called atheists, right? Do you know what the word atheist means? If you look into the Greek, what atheist means, A means against. Theos means God. So they're against God. So in order to be, how can you be against something that you don't believe in? You know, if I do not believe it's going to rain today, do you see me walking around with an umbrella? Do you walk around with the number? You looked at the forecast today and it says zero chance of rain. You look up at the sky and it's really bright and sunny and there's just little whispers of clouds up in the sky that are uh, that are really pretty. And you look up, would you grab an umbrella and say, well, I guess I'm going to need this umbrella today. Why? Because you're not against the rain, right? Because you, you don't believe the rain's going to happen. So, but if you're going to call yourself an atheist, that means you're against God. That means you've got to believe in God to be in order to be an atheist, right? Okay. Just saying. But many people who call themselves atheists and agnostics, they refuse to hear anything about God. I had a guy one time told me, he said, I'm an atheist. I don't want to hear anything about your God. Yet, as soon as something happens to that person, as soon as something, tragedy comes into their life, as soon as they get a report of, of an illness that is just detrimental to their life, something happens financially to them, something happens to somebody in their family, what is the first thing that these people do that, call, that say that they don't believe in God? They go find somebody that they know is a Christian and say, will you pray for me? Why should I pray for you? You don't believe in him anyway. But I need God. Really? I thought he didn't exist. That's what we would like to say, right? But I think God uses this as opportunities that we can witness to these people. But the thing is, is that's the first thing that they do. There's a saying that uh, in the military that there's never an atheist in a foxhole. I was listening to Mike Warnke, which is a, he's a Christian comedian I used to listen to a long time ago, and he was a, a corpsman in the Navy uh, stationed with the Marines fighting in Vietnam. And he said that one time there's this one guy was in, when they was uh, in uh, before they went to Vietnam, and he was talking about how he was an atheist and he didn't believe in God and all like that. And they got into the jungles of Vietnam and started fighting. And he looked over and this guy had a chain, he had a cross, he had a, a star of David, he had a crescent moon, he had a boot, he had so all these other things on this chain. And Mike Warnke looked at him and he says, "What? What's with the necklace?" He goes, "I believe." He goes, well, what do you believe? It's hard to tell what you believe in with all that stuff on. He goes, I don't care. I believe in it all. Whatever's going to keep me safe, I believe in it. But I'm going to tell you something. God don't hear their prayer. Because they've ignored it. I mean, if somebody keeps ignoring you every time you try to go up there and talk to them, how often are you going to keep going up there and talking to them? And when they come up to you, are you going to really listen to what it is that they say? I, I mean, come on. See, those who reject God in their lives yet cry out that they, to somebody that they don't believe in, what an oxymoron. But God will not hear their prayers. If you look at Isaiah 59, 2, he says, But your iniquities have separated you from God. And listen, look at this. And your sins 
All right? Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Your sins, your continual life of sin, your continual rejecting of him, your continual of, of not ever wanting to do what it is that he says, that you want to live in this life of sin, it hides your face from him. He don't even see you, let alone hear you. And you know, I'm going to go a step further. I firmly believe that there are Christian people who call themselves Christians, people who said that they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, yet they willfully want to live the life of sin instead of living the life of God. They want to be able to go out there in the bar rooms on Friday and Saturday night, and they talk like a drunken, crazy sailor all the time, and they live this life of sin, and, and, and you know, and the... And, trying to be with every person that they can get with and everything like that, but yet they want to come to church on Sunday and think that God's going to hear all their prayers. Your choice of living in sin keeps God from hearing your prayers. It says that he don't even see your face. He looks over you. How is he going to hear you if he don't even acknowledge that you are there? You don't acknowledge he's there. You don't listen to him. He's not going to listen to you either. The only prayer that God will hear from these people, from the atheists and the agnostics and the Christians who choose a life of sin over living the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only prayer that he's going to hear from them is the prayer of repentance. When they, when they realize that they need God, when they realize that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes into the Father but by him, when they realize that they have sin in their life, and they need to get rid of the sin in their life, and they're crying out for the blood of Jesus to cover them, that's the prayer that he's going to hear. The Psalms 51, 17 says, A broken and contrite heart, these, O God, you will not despise. But let me tell you something. Don't think for a minute that just because you get caught in sin that you can repent with the full expectation of going and doing it again. All right? It says a broken and contrite heart. A broken heart. Somebody that's truly sorrowful for what they've done. They truly know that they're in a place that they need God and that they can't be without him and they want him desperately in their life. This is a broken and contrite heart and it says that he will not despise it. But if your heart's not broken, you can ask for forgiveness all you want to, but he's not going to hear it because you're actually choosing to sin over God. See, he's going to hear the, the prayer of repentance and accepting him because it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Look at this. It says, for with the heart one believes in the righteousness and with the mouth confession is made until salvation but it's that broken and contrite heart that prays that prayer that opens up the ears of God opens up his eyes to see the plight that you're in and it comes in with his blood and cleanses us amen the second thing that I believe that blocks prayers is doubt we talked a little bit about this last week James 1, 6 and 7 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For not let that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. See, these, like I said last week, are the people that say, God, I know your word says that, you're, that you're, by your stripes I am healed. 
but oh man, I guess I'm just going to have to live with this the rest of my life. God, I know your word says that you will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing such as I cannot explain. But man, oh, I wish I can't ever get my bills paid. I don't know why I can't get my bills paid. I just going I'm going to have to file bankruptcy and live in poverty. But God, your word says, but 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 but, but. doubt heals faith. I'm going to say this: doubt is the kryptonite of faith. How can you believe truly in your heart while doubting what God said? You can't stand in faith on his word if you doubt his word. Right? Doubt will kill your faith quicker than anything. I want to look at this here in Matthew 13. 54 through 58 it says when he had came to his own country he taught them in the synagogue this is jesus okay so that they were astonished where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works see they understood he had wisdom and he was able to perform mighty works so they said where did he get this but look at this he says is this i i, I can hear the sarcasm in their voice right here right is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, J uh, Jose, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with this? Where did this man get these things? You know, can you may see this now? Now they're asking, not in astonishment, where did he get sarcasm? Where did this man get all these things? He says, so they were so offended at him, but Jesus said to him, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now, he did not do mighty works there because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief, they didn't come to him crawling on the ground like the woman with the issue of blood, just just hoping to just reach out and touch the hem of his garment so that the bleeding that had been going on for 12 long years was finally stopped and she was healed. He would, they were not like the man, the blind man sitting on the side of the road hollering, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Even though the people were telling him to be quiet and to shut up, he shouted even louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So that it got Jesus' attention. And when Jesus says, why do you want He says, I want to see See, these people were not like that. Jesus come up to heal somebody, and who do you think you are? We know who your mom and dad is. We know your brothers and everything. We know you grew up right. Who do you really think you are? And he couldn't heal them because they didn't believe. Their doubt of him being the Messiah, their doubt of him being the Son of God, their doubt of him being able to heal them kept them from their healing. Doubt healed their faith. And we know that we receive all things through what? We receive it by faith. See, the Bible says that by faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Moses led the Israelites through the desert. By faith, David, a ruddy little boy, probably only maybe about 13 or 14 years old, grabbed five smooth stones and put them in a shepherd's pouch and stood against the mightiest warrior of the time, a man that was nine feet tall, that had a sword, a shield, and armor and everything else. And he said, he said to him, he says, you come to me blaspheming God, but I come to you in the name of the living God. And it was by faith one stone from a shepherd boy's bag took down a mighty giant by faith. But if you doubt that faith, don't expect anything. Can you imagine what would have happened if David would have walked out to Sam? Ooh, this giant's big. Oh, Oh, this! I just know he's going to kill me. I'm going to, oh, 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 no, 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 don't kill me. Duh. And then he'd have threw that stone in the window in somewhere else, right? Can you imagine if Noah said, 
build a boat? Don't even look like rain to me. The water's like, what, a couple states over it? Ain't going to flood over here. Why would I build a boat? You know? Doubt kills our faith. Hallelujah. The third thing I want to talk about that kills our prayers is husbands who mistreat their wives. Men, listen up, because I'm talking to you directly now, all right? Those who are on Facebook, those who are on YouTube, listen up. 1 Peter 3, 7 says this, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them. Who is them? Their wives. That's what he was talking about here, right? He says, dwell with them with what? Understanding and giving what? Honor to the wife. Wow, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me that God is saying that I have to treat my wife with understanding? That I can't lash out at her just because she's having a bad day? That I have to treat her with honor that no matter if she's mad at me about something, that I'm going to show her that I love her? I can't, do, I can't just lash out at her and raise a hand and just smack her down a couple times? How many times have you heard men say that? I'll just smack them down. Let's go back to what this, what this scripture says here. All right? It says, Dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. Giving honor to, as the weaker vessel. I want to ask you this. If you have a... Fifth Dynasty Ming vase. Do you put it out where it can get kicked around and knocked down or anything like that? Or do you put it on a pedestal? Hear me, guys. All right. Or do you put that vase on a pedestal so that it can be admired safely? Why? Because it's a weak vessel. It's easy to break, right? Men, you can so easily break your wife's spirit by the way you treat them. It says that we are to give honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. And look at this, being heirs together, joint heirs in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, men. You are no more closer to Jesus Christ than your wife is. As a matter of fact, if you look into most churches today and look at who's sitting in the seats of most churches today, women outnumber men. Why? Because they have a stronger faith in Jesus Christ than most men do. Most men would rather go fishing on Sunday, go hunting on Sunday, watch the football game on Sunday, than they would to sit in the church and hear what it is that God's got to say what they're doing wrong in their life. All right? Okay. Women outnumber men in churches. But so, but the Bible says that they are, are joint heir. They're heirs together of grace of life. Now, I want, this is what I want you to really pay attention to right here. It says, you got to do all this so that what? Your prayers may not be hindered. Now, I want to go as far as this, the Greek word, and I'll look this up. The Greek word for hinder is ekopto. Do you know what ekopto means in Greek? To be cut off, to be cut out. That means men who do not treat their wives with understanding, men who do not treat their wives with honor, men who do not treat their wives as joint heirs in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that your prayers are cut off from heaven. You're up there hitting a brick wall every time you send a prayer up to heaven. 
You can pray all you want. You can be the man of God that you think that you want to be and sit there and say long flowing prayers like the priest used to do out in public. And you can look over there at somebody else and say, God, I thank you that I'm not a sinner like that person over there is and that I pay my tithes and that I do all the fasting I'm supposed to do and I do all these other things like that over there and I thank you I'm not like that person over there. All you want to. But your prayers are cut off. By the way, you treat your wife. Jesus said, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He cared for the church. He nurtured the church. The Bible says that when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet and Peter says, oh, no, Lord, do you don't, don't wash my feet. He said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you can't have nothing to do with me. He says, I come to be, not to be served, to, but to be a servant of all. And I'm, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to keep going on this because this is, this is a preview of the Father's Day message that I'm going to preach, okay? But we can't dishonor our wives or our prayers are cut off from heaven. God will not hear them. You know what really gets me? is men in public that will publicly disgrace their wives and think that they are so righteous. I've heard pastors in the church tell their wives to sit down and shut up. Nobody wants to hear anything coming out of their mouth. I've heard that before in a church. All right? Do you think God heard that man's prayers? And what? And let the wife see that she respects her husband. That means, wives, if your husband is doing what they're supposed to do, if they're loving you as Christ loved the church, that you have to honor them as the head of the household. Doesn't mean that you're their servant. Doesn't mean that they're your doormat. Uh, you're their doormat or anything else. Okay. It means simply that you honor them as the church honors Christ, as the head. All right? And in Ephesus, only the men had rights. That's why Peter spoke to the men about their prayers. However, I'm mean, excuse me, not Peter, Paul. I'm sorry. Paul spoke it. All right? But however, both husband and wives are called to honor each other. Then wives will have their uh, wives will also have their prayers hindered or cut off from heaven for dishonoring their husbands. But who has the greatest responsibility? The husband does. He's the head of the household. He sets the tone for the household. How can a man, how can a woman honor a man that comes constantly dishonors her? And I'm going to tell you something. Men, you want your wife to honor you? You want your, you want your wife to to honor you as the church honors Christ, then you have the greatest responsibility of loving them first as Christ loved the church. If you don't believe me, look in Romans 5, 8. It says that while we were yet sinners, while we were still the very enemies of God, Christ died for us. He didn't wait and say, you filthy, dirty sinner, you get yourself right and I'll get on that cross. Until you do that, uh-uh, no way. I'm not doing this. That's not what he did. He got on the cross first to demonstrate his great love for us so that we, in turn, as the church, can honor him. If your wife's dishonoring you, maybe you need to look at how you're treating her. All right. I said I wasn't going to preach my Father's Day sermon, and I already started it. <laughs> Wait till Father's Day. You're going to get even more. Because not only am I, going to, am I going to tell men what they're doing wrong, but I'm going to tell men how to do it the right way too, okay? All right? So look forward to it. Look forward to it, men. Stay tuned. Come in. I'm not going to beat you up on Father's Day. I'm going I'm to love on you, and I'm going to help you on Father's Day too. God's already given me a message for Father's Day, all right? Okay, so we talked about our prayers not being heard. We talked about how God does not hear prayers because of, 
uh, 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 we're, we're in sin. We choose sin over him. We choose to live a life of sin so God, our, our God doesn't even see our face or hear our prayers. We talked about how doubt kills our faith. It's the kryptonite to our faith. And we talked about how if we don't love and honor our wives or our husbands, that our prayers are cut off. So how can we effectively pray? What makes an effective prayer? Cam. All right. I want to look at a couple things today that help you on praying effectively. Remember we said that effective means that we want to gain a certain effect, right? So to gain that effect that we want, we have to be effective. First thing I want to talk about is praying in faith. Praying in faith. Matthew 7, 20 says, So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. And I want you to look at this. He says, and nothing will be impossible for you. What is he saying here? If you believe, nothing will be impossible for you. That means that this mountain that's in my life of 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 you know sickness that's in my life right now that I can make this mountain move when you believe which is with the faith the size of a mustard seed not doubting any at all that can even be say God I've never seen a mountain move but I know your word says that I can move that mountain so God I'm asking you to show me a mountain move and the mountain will move. I remember one time when I was in the Navy and I was reading about uh, the, the, the waves and, and, you know, the storm that they were in and that how God or Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat and he was giving the disciples the opportunity to exercise their faith and calm the seas. But instead, they started saying, they, they woke him up and they said, Master, are you not afraid that we're going to drown? And he stood up and he rebuked the wind and the waves. And then he said to them, he says, oh, you of little faith. And I was on the ship. And we were out. At, we were out. I think we were. Yeah, we were in the Mediterranean and we were kind of in a little bit of a storm. And, and it was it was tossing around and so forth like that. And I'm reading. I says, Lord, does that mean that I can actually calm a storm, a real storm, too? Because these disciples were in a real storm. It wasn't a fictitious storm. It wasn't just a storm that was happening in their personal lives that was going on. They were in a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and the waves were crashing in on them, and they thought they were going to drown. God, does this mean that I can actually calm a storm? So I walked out onto the flight deck of the ship, and I says, Lord, help me. In my faith. And I said, in the name of Jesus, be calm. And the storm started to calm down. Now, was it me that did that? No. It was faith that allowed God to move on my request. Simply because I didn't doubt. I said, in faith. And you know something? That faith was the size of a mustard seed because I had never, ever seen a, quorum, a, a storm calmed like that before. But I wanted to see it. So I want to ask you something. What kind of mountain is in your life right now? What kind of mountain is standing in the way of your healing? What kind of mountain is standing in the way of, your, of you being financially free right now? What kind of mountain is standing in the way of your loved ones coming to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? What kind of mountain are you facing right now that you want to see that mountain move? All you have to do is simply ask in faith. Look at that mountain and say, mountain in the name of Jesus, be moved. 
I was riding my motorcycle the other day. I was telling Rachel about this. I was riding my motorcycle the other day, and I came to a red light trying to get to work and kind of getting close to being, uh, you know, uh, there when I'm supposed to be and, and not be late. And motorcycles do not change red lights. All right? They are just not heavy enough for those sensors to change. All right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I know I must have waited almost about 10 minutes. And I'm like, oh, I wish this light would just move, change. Oh, why don't this light just change? Come on, light. Come on, light. Finally, it dawned on me. Why have I not said it in faith? I said, in the name of Jesus, turn green. And as soon as I did, said that, this car pulled up beside me and the light turned green. But it's by faith. We have to speak to the mountains in faith to see them move. So what kind of faith does it take? Knowing that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he said he will do. Look at Numbers 23, 19. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, I, uh, has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and, and will not he, not he make it good? In other words, he's saying, if God says he's going to do it, he's going to do it if you simply believe him. Because God is not a man who will change his mind. He ain't going to make you a promise and then say, nah, I didn't really mean that. All right. He's not going to say that you can have something and say, nah, I decided I'm not giving it to you. It's not who God is. If he says he's going to do it, He's going to do it. If he says he's going to give it to you, he's going to give it to you. All we have to do is believe. Because I'm going to tell you something that's like this. If I come walking in here with a gift, all pretty, wrapped up with a nice big bow on it, and I come up there and I say, hey, this gift is for you, and I'm holding it out to you, and you say, nah, that ain't for me, and turn around and walk away. Have you received your gift that was promised to you? But how many times do we do that? God promises something. We say, nah, he really didn't mean that and walk away from it. And then we say, I don't understand why I'm not getting blessed. Mr. Jones over there, man, he, he, you know, somebody came and paid his debt off for him. Why can't that ever happen to me? Hmm? Well, Miss Susie over there, she, she got healed of cancer, yet I still got cancer. I don't understand it. Because you refuse to believe that the mountain can be moved. God's given it to you. All you have to do is accept it. And if God is who he says he is and he does what he says he will do, then there is nothing that God will not do for you in faith. Matthew 19, 26 says, But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Another thing that's going to help you to effectively pray is praying according to God's will. Now, I'm not saying I'm praying according to my will, all right? But pray according to God's will. I want you to look at 1 John 5, 14 and 15. It says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. See, this is where so many people get confused about praying for something that they want versus praying in God's will. See, they say, I want the nice, re the pretty red Camaro that does 160 miles an hour. But that's not God's will, right? You know, I want the nice big old boat that, 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 that sits out there. You can't even pull it up on the trailer. I want that big old nice boat sitting out there at the marina right there. But that's not God's will. 
But when we know what God's will is and we ask according to his will, then what does it say? That he hears us and that if we know that he hears us, that uh, we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. We have it according to his will. You know, Pastor Rachel and I started praying about the church. What, what, what are we going to do? And what we wanted to do is we didn't want to just jump into something that was according to our will. But we wanted to ask according to his will. And just like our house, when we got our house, we didn't want to just, uh, this is a pretty house. And we had, we looked at it and we saw so many things that we could do with this house and with this property and so forth like that. And we, you know, but what was, we said, Lord, if this is your will, we asked God to open doors that he wanted open and to close doors that he wanted closed. We wanted to pray according to his will. God, if this is your will that we have this then we ask you to make it possible. If this is not your will, if this is not what you have for us, shut every door and don't ever let it happen. And God heard our prayer. So what it is that you're going through right now, what it is that you ask it that way. God, if this is your will, pray according to his will. What is your will, O oh God, right? Because Jeremiah 29, 11 says what? I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans not to bring you harm, but to bring you a future and a hope, right? So if God already knows the plans that he has for you, and he's, his plans are not to bring you disaster, but to bring you a future and a hope, then guess what? When we pray according to his will, then we're going to get what it is that we ask for. Right? You know, I think of it like this. If a child asks his parents for something that they know that their parents want them to have, what happens? They get it, right? So when we pray according to God's will, and we know that not only does he hear us, but he answers us and gives us what it is that we're asking. So are you praying for a family f uh, member or friend to come to Christ? Did you know that God wants your friends and family to come to salvation? Second Peter two three uh, two, th Second Peter three nine. Excuse me, I got a little tongue tied there. It says the Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. So when you're praying for somebody to come to salvation, guess what? You're praying according to God's will, right? So believe it. We got family members that we're praying for right now to come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we have an expectation that it's going to happen because we know that we're praying according to God's will. Are you praying for you or someone to be healed? Did you know that God wants you and others healed in your body, in your mind, in your spirit? Luke 5, 12 and 13 says, And it happened when a, uh, he was in a certain city that behold a man who was now full of leprosy saw Jesus. And he fell on his face and implored of him. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, he, Jesus, put his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy left him. God wants us to be healed. He wants us to be whole in body, mind, and spirit. And when we pray according to that, when we say, Lord, I, we know that your word says in 1 Peter 2, 24, that by your stripes, we were healed. We're praying according to his word. And we know that it's going to happen. We have that expectation. See, then, then we can start erasing doubt, right? All right? What did, what did James say? A man that doubts is like a wave tossed on the ocean. We're, we're going to come in in faith. We're not going to ebb back out in doubt. Amen? Because we know that this is, what, this is God's will. This is what he wants. And we can pray according to his will and earnestly expect the answer that we're looking for. 
we have we want a certain effect to happen and we're going to effectively pray for it amen there are many other things that God's willing to give his children those who have put their faith in him all we have to do is read his word to see that it is full of his willingness to hear and to answer the last thing I want to talk about is consistent fervent praying James 5, 16 says, The effective, fervent prayers of the righteous man avail us much. Now, I want to I look at this right here. What did he mean by the effective, fervent prayers? What does the word fervent really mean? The word fervent means to have or displaying a passionate intensity, feverish, hot, burning, or glowing. But it's that passionate intensity that I want to talk about. When you have a passion for something, nothing's going to stand in your way to do what it is that you're really wanting to do, right? You know? You can be passionate about, there's people that are passionate about Saints football. And every time the Saints are in the Superdome playing, they're going to be there in the Superdome. They're going to buy those tickets. They're going to spend whatever it takes to get those tickets. They're going to drive all the way over there and stand in line at the door waiting to get in there to go see the Saints lose again. I mean, win again or something, whatever, right? Okay? I, I didn't mean to offend any Saints fans because I'm a Saints fan myself. So anyway. But they got a passion for that. Win, lose, or not, they're going to go watch them, right? Whatever their favorite football team. It might be the Cowboys or the Eagles or the, well, it used to be Washington Redskins. I don't know what to call themselves now, you know. Huh? Nationals? Yeah, you know. Commanders. All right. Well, we're going to have somebody find that offensive, too, and have the name change. Watch it. But anyway, uh, Whatever it is, uh, or, or whatever sport it is, it might not be football. You might be a rest, uh, uh, you know, a wrestling fan, or you might be a racing fan, you know. And, and you know, I mean, if you wasn't a Dale Earnhardt or a Jeff Gordon, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm just kidding with you. But you know, but no matter what it is, people pay lots of money. Have you ever looked at these things? And when they pay in the stands, they are full of people because they have a passion for it. But, you know, can you imagine if these same people had a passion for God and his will in the same way that they do for the things of this world? All right. Can you imagine what would happen? I mean, Joshua had such a passion for God and, and, and they were fighting a battle. And he says, Lord, I need you to not let the sun set. Until this battle is won. And for seven hours, the sun stayed up in the noontime. Seven hours. The earth stood still and did not let the sun set because Joshua had a passion to win, this play, to win the land for God. Can you imagine the passion that you can have for God and the things that you can do? Passion for God. That's the fervent, effective prayer. And it says it does what? It avails much. Hallelujah. I want you to, to look at Luke 9, 11, 9 through 10. It says, so I say to you, and we talked about this last week. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who fi seeks finds, and him who knocks it will be open. That does not mean to a knock one time. If you want to get in on somebody's door, you got a neighbor or a friend that you want to go check on, do you go knock on their door and go, oh, well, they're not home, and leave? You keep knocking. You know, you probably even start calling their name. Hey, Jim Bob, it's Joe. Come to the door. All right? If you don't get that, how many times do people, you walked around to the windows looking in the window making sure they're okay? I don't see them in there. All right? 
but you keep on till they open the door, right? Now, what's it usually the first thing you said? Hey, man, didn't you hear me knocking? But you keep knocking. You keep, you know, you, you don't walk in a room one time and say, man, I, I got to find my keys. Walk in the room. Nope, they're not in here. I walk out, right? You start doing like I do. You start moving things around. Turn it in. I know I'll put them here somewhere. They got to be here somewhere. All right? You start looking for them. And then my wife's going, I ain't never seen nothing like this in my life. <laughs> but you keep knocking. You keep seeking. All right? You keep asking. I want to talk to you about this asking. In Luke 18, 2 through 5, it said there was a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now, there was a widow in the city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said to himself, now listen, and look at this. He says, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet. Because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest her continual coming she weary me. He's saying, look, I don't care. Man, I don't go to church. I don't, I don't, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. You know, I, 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 people, I don't care, man. I'm, I'm a judge already. I don't care what they got to say anymore. This is an appointment that's for life. They, they can't vote me out of it. You know, and then here comes this little old woman, and she keeps coming, and she keeps coming, and she keeps coming and asking and asking and asking and asking. And she finally says, oh, man, this woman, she's just wearing me down. Okay, 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 I'm going to get justice for her simply because she's wearing me down. She's wearing me out, and he gives it to her. Jesus says, how much more when we ask God? See, when we know it's his will, we may not get it right away because he's telling us to wait. Right? Remember the kid with the cookies? How many times does your kid ask, keep asking you for cookies till he finally say, okay, go have a cookie? Right? And they get a cookie. That's what God's telling us to do. Because can you keep asking, believing you're going to get it? Can you ask and can you keep asking for something not believing you're going to get it? You ask because you know that you can get it, right? That is called faith. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. In conclusion, no, not all prayers are answered. Not all prayers are even heard. Those who refuse to acknowledge God for who he really is and those who love their own sin more than God are not even heard, just like those who mistreat their wives or their husbands. Doubt is the kryptonite that kills faith. Why ask if you refuse to believe that he will give you what he promised? However, we can be assured when we pray as children of God, praying in faith, knowing his promises are true, it opens heaven's doors for you. Also, praying according to his will through his word. You want to know God's will? Take your Bible off the shelf, dust it off, open it up, and start reading it, and you will know God's will for your life. It's right in here. Right. This is the greatest love letter that has ever been written. All we have to do is just read it. But when we pray according to his word. And that he is. And never give up, but be passionate about your prayers, knowing that to trust in God is also to trust God. In his timing. Stand with me please. If you're here today. Or you are joining us on Facebook. Or YouTube. And you say pastor. There's reasons that I know. That you touched on today. That my prayers. Are not getting heard by God. 
But I know today I want my prayers to be heard. All we have to do is repent. Remember the first prayer that he's going to hear of the sinner is the prayer of repentance. And he says that when we come to him with a broken and contrite heart, a contrite heart means a heart that is longing for him. By no means will he ever cast out. You might be here and you say, I, I've accepted Christ as my Savior, but I've not been walking the walk. And my prayers have not been heard because of that. We know that his word says that if we, all we have to do is simply come to him, confess our sins. He is faithful and just to cleanse us for our sin and, and forgive us for our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You might be here saying, Pastor, I just need to believe more and doubt less. Simply ask God to forgive you for your doubts. And take God at his word. Develop that fervent, passionate prayer that God wants you to have. Just pray with me. Say, Jesus. I ask you to forgive me for all my sins, to cleanse me and make me righteous. I come to you with a repentant heart, and I know you hear that prayer. Lord, I'm asking you to remove doubt from my life. Help me, Lord, to burn with your passion. Help me, Lord, to be passionate about you so that when I pray according to your will, I know that I will be heard and I will receive my answer. Today, Lord, I come with open arms just as I am. Make this song part of your prayer. Father, just as I am, Lord God, here I am before you. Lord, today we acknowledge who we are in Christ Jesus. Lord, we are your sons and your daughters, Lord. And we know that we are the children of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth. And Lord, today, there is no more doubt in our minds of how you love us and how you want to respond.